Committee will come to order. <clears throat> Johnson & Johnson's recall of children's Tylenol and other children's medicines and the phantom recall of Motrin. Good morning and thank you all for being here. Uh, this is our second hearing on disturbing recall of children's medicine by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, at our first hearing, we learned that J&J's April 30 recall of children's Tylenol, children's Motrin, children's Benadryl and Tylenol infants drops was the largest recall of children's medicine in history. More than 135 million bottles of children's medicines were recalled. We also learned that there wasn't just one recall. We heard testimony about rolling recalls, a phantom recall, a plant shutdown, and management firings since then. We have obtained additional documents which raise troubling questions about both the accuracy of J&J's earlier testimony and the extent of the phantom recall. When Johnson & Johnson learned it had a problem with one of its adult Motrin products in 2008 and 2009, the company hired contractors to go into stores and buy the product off the shelves without saying it was a recall so that the public and the news media would know what was really happening. When J&J &J was asked about the, this phantom recall at our first hearing and about the behavior of its contractors, we were basically told that J&J &J did not know what the contractors were doing. However, documents subsequent, subsequent, subsequently obtained by the committee shows that J&J &J dictated how the phantom recall would be carried out. Internal emails and other documents indicate that J&J &J clearly knew what it was doing and why. For example, referring to the problems with Motrin that resulted in the phantom recall one McNeil executive said, we are just trying to prevent a recall and a lot of expended dollars. In an, uh, another email, uh, McNeil executive referred to the phantom recall and says, this was a major win for us as it limits the press that will be seen. Finally, it appears the president of the company gave the go-ahead for the phantom recall, saying, let's make this happen as soon as possible. Perhaps we can clear up this apparent discrepancy between J and J testimony in May and the documents that have come to light since that time. J and J has said the FDA knew about and approved the phantom recall, but FDA says that isn't, that isn't true. Both sides will have an opportunity to tell their side of the story today. But even if the FDA was technically aware of it, that does not excuse what Johnson and Johnson did. Johnson and Johnson had both the legal and moral obligation to do the right thing, and they did not. There are also new questions. Our investigations Investigations has uncovered documents that show J&J &J hired the phantom recall contractors to perform work related to children's Tylenol. In light of what we know now about the phantom recall of adult Motrin, I think J&J &J has a duty to fully explain how it handled problems with children's medicine. Finally, the troubling issues about rolling recalls and phantom recalls that this hearing examined makes one point very, very clear. Even if the FDA had been notified about the motion problem, the agency did not have the legal authority to order a recall. This needs to be rectified. The FDA needs mandatory recall authority, which in, we've been pushing for. I think most people would be surprised to learn that the FDA, the agency that is responsible for ensuring drug safety, has no power to order a company to recall its defective drugs. This is why I introduced a bill 
that would give the FDA mandatory recall authority. Hopefully, we can avoid future phantom recalls and empower the FDA to take action to protect the American people. Both Johnson and Johnson and the FDA will be asked questions today, and I hope they are prepared to give us the answers that we need to make certain that we, the drugs that are on the shelf are safe. On this note, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important second hearing on the failure of FDA regulators, FDA regulators, FDA regulators of the Johnson & Johnson failure to protect the American people. I think it is critical for us today to understand that Johnson & Johnson and its subsidiaries do not get a pass for failing to meet the high standards expected of their company through their long history. That failure will mar Johnson & Johnson's image for many years to come. No matter how much they correct it, they will live with the repercussions of their failures. But the American people will also, at the end of these hearings, recognize that government has failed to do its job. FDA's explanation appears to include seemingly false statements to this committee in April of this year. Given the documents received by the committee, it demonstrates the FDA was, in fact, aware that Johnson & Johnson quiet recall of adult Motrin products, something they led us to believe they were not. Even if we gave them additional authority for mandatory recalls, if they were complicit in a silent recall, then to what end would that new authority be? Mr. Chairman, fundamental concerns of this committee are making government do its job. In the case of the FDA, that means making sure that those who regulate our food and drug supply are careful, thorough, and honest. Regrettably, the pattern emerging at FDA is one of carelessness, deficiencies, and untruthfulness. Now, this is the committee that has sufficient, now that this committee has sufficient evidence of FDA failure, we must be committed to following up that investigation and its needed reforms. New authority may be part of it, but no amount of authority makes up for failure to do the job you already have authority for and responsibility. Now, Mr. Chairman, there are differences in views today on what, where this committee should focus its oversight. Well-intentioned men and women on both sides of a partisan aisle often disagree with the best of intentions. We find, <clears throat> when we find agreement, on our oversight responsibility, we should pursue them together. That is the case with the FDA and many other issues before this committee. In 2007, White House Chief of Staff uh, Rahm Emanuel, then Congressman from Chicago and head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, described the important role of this that this committee plays to ensure responsibility and accountability of government. He said, we, the Democratic Party, want to be the party that is fettering out waste and fraud, and the Oversight Committee is the point of the spear for us. Similarly, this committee's former chairman, my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman, noted that Congress does not always fulfill its duty to the American people to provide oversight of the administration. He said, Congress has failed to meet this constitutional oversight responsibility. Our issue, I see, on issue after issue, the Congress has failed to conduct meaningful investigations of significant wrongdoing. I happen to agree with Mr. Waxman and Mr. Rahm Emanuel. These are constitutional obligations, and we must vigorously meet those responsibilities. Fortunately, the Chairman and I are pursuing a common investigation. It leads us to two sides and two failures. The public has a right to know how Johnson & Johnson got to this point, how they are going to get their reputation back by earning it with high-quality products that meet or exceed all standards. That is important, and it should be bipartisan. Mr. Chairman, today we also have to remember that our first part of our name, Government Oversight and Reform Committee, 
implies exactly what it means. We are overseeing government. Yes, we are also seeing when government fails in its interaction with business. We must, though, remember that our authority is to oversee and then reform. I, for one, in 2005 had the opportunity to oversee the Mineral Management Service and show that they were a dysfunctional organization too cozy with those that they oversaw. Unfortunately, in the years that followed, we didn't have reform. And in 2010, the American people paid a high price for that failure to reform. When it comes to the FDA, we have seen the same thing, at least in this circumstance. We cannot fail to do that reform. We cannot wait for the American people to pay with their lives without a yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement, and I want you to know that we are going to live up to our name, oversight and government reform. I want you to know that. Uh, now you call on the gentleman from Maryland for three minutes, uh, Congressman Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for convening this very important uh, follow-up hearing to consider the safety of medications for children and families, and I am extremely troubled by what appears to be an egregious pattern of behavior on the part of Johnson & Johnson and their subsidiary, McNeil Consumer Health Care. And as I listen to Mr. Issa, I must say that uh, I am also, I think we need to reserve judgment uh, because uh, the FDA, the Principal Deputy uh, Commissioner Sharfstein will be testifying. And I know him to be a very, uh, he, he was head of Baltimore's uh, Health Department. And I can think of no one with more integrity and, and more, uh, has put more effort into protecting the safety of our fellow citizens. Now, the Johnson Johnson website states that, quote, the values that guide our decision making are spelled out in our credo. Put simply, our credo challenges us to put the needs and well being of the people we serve first. Living these values, McNeil Consumer Healthcare and Johnson Johnson were lauded for their efforts uh, recalling Tylenol and temporarily stopping advertising when lives were on the line due to uh, cyanide contamination in 1982. The recent events could not be more d different. One day after our last hearing, Blacksmith Brands recalled Pediacare because the products were manufactured by McNeil Healthcare, even though McNeil officials had said that they did not manufacture products for other companies. Yet it doesn't stop there. In June and July 2010, McNeil Healthcare twice expanded their original January 15, 2010 recall because of TBA contamination, a pesticide and, and flame retardant. Why exactly were these items not identified six months prior uh, in the original recall? Perhaps most disturbing, McNeil, McNeil's consumer health care and Johnson & Johnson conspired to put profits first. There is no other conclusion that simply can be drawn. McNeil hired contractors to simply act like regular, con uh, regular customers when conducting a soft market withdrawal of tainted Motrin from over 4,000 convenience stores in more than 40 states. Any product that needs to be recalled through a phantom or, or a regular recall should not be in the hands of consumers and is probably unsafe. Revealing the true motivation for these events, McNeil President Peter Luther wrote on May 27, 2009, given our current financial situation, I hope we are not going to really double our cost to do this. Let us make this happen as soon as possible. Minutes later, J&J &J Vice President for Sales Gary Benedict responded via email that he wanted more information on the situation that day. These actions clearly show that McNeil and Johnson & Johnson knew the product was not safe and that they, clo and, and, and they chose to make profits their first consideration over the safety of their constituents. And with that, I look forward to the testimony, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman from Maryland for his statement. I now yield three minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, for calling this hearing. Thank you all for being here today. Obviously, the American people rely upon the FDA to, in, in, to uh, make sure that our country and our people and our children are, are safe and secure. We also rely upon big brand names, people like McNeil and Johnson & Johnson, to provide good quality products that families and mothers can use with their children. Uh, yet, despite the hearing earlier this year, uh, there are some very concerning uh, issues that have come to, to light. Uh, I am very disappointed that the FDA has evidently not given us access to the people on the ground, uh, in Puerto Rico in particular, that have firsthand knowledge of what is happening. I, I, I 
do simply do not understand why the San Juan District Director is not made available uh, as she would provide the most uh, the best, most comprehensive type of, of information given the, the direct uh, nature in which she has been involved. And I think we need to further explore that, Mr. Chairman. Um, and then within the uh, Johnson & Johnson, I want to read the, some quotes from emails. And I, you know, if you spend time in your testimony giving us platitudes and, you know, reading things that some corporate communications person wrote, I think you are going to see a frustrated group of members. When we read, quote, and I, these are quotes from within Johnson & Johnson to other Johnson & Johnson employees, quote, FDA is really bending the rules in this case, the Motrin Caplet case, because of the fact that we stopped distribution a while ago, end quote. In another email, quote, regarding FDA documents, all my conversation with the FDA director, Ms. Torres, here in, in Puerto Rico have been off the record since I cannot quote her. This happens due to my good relationship with her. That is why we, we are doing something very different. Quote from another email, the district director is already sticking her neck out as her boss in Washington is more in favor of a recall. End quote. We need some answers from Johnson & Johnson's and we need some answers from the FDA because the candor has not been there. It has not been there. This committee has an obligation to the American people to get to the bottom of this. And there is some funny business happening here, and nobody is happy about it. Please, don't just read some testimony that gives us platitudes. Answer these questions. They are serious, and there are millions of Americans that are relying upon the answers to these questions. But based on the evidence that we are starting to see more and more of, it looks like there was much too much of a cozy relationship that does not give the confidence to the American people to buy your products and to ins insist and make sure that the FDA is actually doing its job. I yield back. I would like to thank the gentleman from Utah for his statement. I now yield uh, three minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, Mr. Chaffetz. Um, we don't know if it is in this case, but there are so many areas where regulators and the regulated have a cozy relationship which works to the detriment of the American people. I mean, we, we need only to look to the BP oil catastrophe to have that underlined boldly. And there sadly are many other examples. Uh, we will find out if that is the case here. Uh, but I, I want to caution some of my colleagues about how we define the work of this committee. Because on, on one hand, um, some of my colleagues would reject a beneficial role for government in people's lives. And on the other hand, when a regulatory agency does attempt to uh, uh, assert government responsibility for uh, corporate misconduct, uh, that is not recognized. I mean, the, the, this committee is not just oversight of the government. It is oversight of misconduct in the private sector. And there is plenty, uh, it's, rather, it is oversight of, of corporate conduct in the, in the private sector. And there is plenty of misconduct in the corporate sector. Now, why does it happen? Well, it happens for a lot of reasons, mostly greed. Why doesn't the government always come forward quickly and call corporations on it? There is a lot of reasons why that happen. One, happens. One of the reasons is because corporations in, in, uh, assert enormous influence on this government because of their campaign contributions. That is the clear fact, incontrovertible evidence to that effect. So we have a problem with the system. Within the context of the system, the American people have a problem in being able to trust corporations. And in this case, uh, Johnson & Johnson is going to have to answer a lot of serious questions about why they should continue to merit the public's trust when apparently they uh, concealed from public awareness information that was vital to protecting people's health. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I, I understand the bill that you are preparing uh, for this Congress. I think we should start um, also considering another dimension of corporate responsibility, and that is that if we are able to establish that a corporation knowingly avoided their responsibility to inform the public about a material matter that could create serious injury or death 
that that corporation's corporate charter should be canceled and that we should instruct the Justice Department to take steps to do just that in cooperation with Attorney General in various states. I mean, really, if, if you do any, if you have any conduct that hurts people and people rely on you to, to do the right thing and you don't do the right thing, uh, you should actually be put out of business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Ohio for his um, uh, statement. Uh, now we will turn to our first panel. Our first witnesses are Mr. William Weldon and Ms. Colleen Goggins. William Weldon is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Johnson & Johnson. Ms. Colleen Goggins is Worldwide Chair of the Johnson & Johnson Consumer Group, and she also testified at the Committee's first hearing. Welcome, both of you. It is Committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right, right hand while I minister the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answer if we may be seated. Uh, the, the rule is here that, of course, you have uh, five minutes to um, give a summary. We have your statement if, you know, for the record. And, of course, there is a light that comes on, and when you have one minute left, uh, the yellow light comes on, and then, of course, at the end is a red light, and the red light, of course, means stop. Uh, so, um, Mr. Weldon, if you would start, and, uh, um, and then, of course, after that, you, Ms. Goggins. Yeah, Thank Mr. you. Weldon. Chairman Welcome. Towns, Congressman Issa, and members of the committee. I'm Bill Weldon, the chairman. On your mic. I'm the Bill mic. Weldon, yeah. chairman and chief executive officer of Johnson & Johnson. I appreciate the opportunity before you to appear before you today to describe our efforts to address the serious quality issues at McNeil Consumer Health Care. As you know, I was unable, because of back surgery, to testify at the committee's hearing in May. I was grateful for the opportunity to meet with both the Chairman and Congressman Issa shortly afterwards to discuss our response to the recalls. It is essential that we work closely with Congress, the FDA, and others to restore the public's confidence in McNeil Consumer Health Care's products. Mr. Chairman, I know that we let the public down. We did not maintain our high quality standards, and as a result, children do not have access to our important medicines. I accept full accountability for the problems at McNeil, and I will take full accountability for fixing these problems. After we found a substantial quality issue at McNeil, we instituted a broad precautionary recall of all liquid children's products manufactured in Fort Washington. And even though our medical experts and the FDA agreed that the health risk was remote, we believed it was the right thing to do for patients. We also commenced a complete reexamination of McNeil's manufacturing processes. We are working hard to restore the public's trust and confidence in Johnson & Johnson and to strive to ensure that something like this never happens ever again. I have, sp I have spent my entire professional career at Johnson & Johnson. I was honored to be appointed Chairman and Chief Executive Officer in 2002. I am very proud to lead Johnson & Johnson and our dedicated, hardworking professionals. We are working hard to bring our important pediatric products back to the market responsibly. Indeed, I am pleased to announce that consumers will soon begin to see McNeil Liquid Pediatric products back on the shelves. During the week of October 4th, we will begin shipping one of McNeil's children's medicine products to our customers. Although available only in limited quantities at first, almost one million bottles, these will be available for release next week, and we expect to distribute a total of four million bottles in the United States by the end of the year. As Colleen Goggins testified in May, it is important for consumers to know that the April 2010 recall was not undertaken on the basis of reports of adverse medical events. When we first found the issues that led to the April 2010 recall, we stopped shipping the products, shut down the plant, and issued a broad precautionary recall of all liquid medicines. We have kept McNeil's Fort Washington facility shut down, and we are completely revamping the facility to bring both equipment 
and procedures up to the high standards that we set for ourselves around the world. The facility will not reopen until we are confident that we can make McNeil products to the high quality standards that the public, Congress, and the FDA rightfully expect of us. Across McNeil, Johnson & Johnson is investing more than $100 million on facilities, equipment, and other improvements. McNeil retained an independent third-party consultant with expertise in manufacturing and quality systems. McNeil also appointed a new Vice President of Quality Assurance, a new Vice President of Operations, a new Plant Manager at Fort Washington, and a new Head of Quality for the Fort Washington plant. Since the hearing in May, these efforts have accelerated. As Ms. Goggins promised during the May hearing, we submitted a comprehensive action plan to the FDA in July. We have established new quality officers for each of our three business segments. Quality and manufacturing report to a single point with oversight of our operating companies. This person reports directly to me. I have also personally visited many of our manufacturing facilities to reinforce the importance of quality. In your letter inviting me to testify, you raised questions about the recall of two lots of eight caplet Motrin vials. The documents that we provided to the committee show that McNeil informed FDA officials about our plans for an in-store assessment and then a retrieval of any of the eight caplet Motrin vials that remained available for sale. I do think the McNeil personnel were trying to be transparent with the FDA. McNeil also notified its customers that it would be sending a in personnel to remove the products. Nonetheless, based on what I have learned since the May hearing, including the points that this committee brought to light, it is clear to me that in retrospect, McNeil should have handled things differently. And going forward, if similar situations arise, they will be handled differently. Mr. Chairman, I am committed to working cooperatively with the committee and the FDA to get the McNeil products back on the shelves for the people who rely on them. We look forward to earning back the trust of all those who have depended upon Johnson & Johnson to take care of themselves and their families for decades. I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Weldon, for your uh, statement. Uh, Ms. Goggins? Sorry. Uh, Chairman Towns, Congressman Issa, and members of the committee, I am Colleen Goggins, the worldwide chairman of the consumer group of Johnson & Johnson. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, as I did in May, to discuss our efforts to address the quality and process issues at McNeil Consumer Health Care. Because my May testimony contains considerable detail concerning McNeil and the recent recalls, I will be brief in my testimony today. Since my prior appearance before this committee, we have continued to work very hard to address the problems at McNeil. As Mr. Weldon stated, McNeil submitted to the FDA a Comprehensive Action Plan, or CAP, in July. The CAP applies to all the manufacturing facilities McNeil operates to supply the U.S. market, not just the Fort Washington facility that remains closed. The CAP is part of our ongoing dialogue with the FDA to improve product quality, improve quality systems, and enhance training. Under the CAP, we have engaged leading experts on manufacturing <laughs> processes, and we have also dedicated Johnson & Johnson's own experts to our efforts at McNeil. Mr. Chairman, I understand from your letter inviting me to appear today that you have questions concerning my testimony about the Motrin Caplets recall in 2009. I regret if my testimony created any confusion, and I hope that I can clear up any confusion today. By way of background, I learned that the committee was interested in the Motrin recall for the first time during the morning session of the May hearing. We quickly gathered what information we could prior to my testimony in the afternoon, and during my testimony, we committed to providing additional information to the committee, which we have now done. At the hearing in May, I told the committee that I believed that there had been discussions with the FDA about our plans with a third-party contractor in connection with the Motrin Caplets. I believe that the documents we have now obtained and provided to the committee reflect these discussions and McNeil's efforts to be transparent and act in good faith with the agency. As I tried to make clear in my testimony, I had no knowledge at the time of the May hearing of any instructions that may have been given to any contractor. Since the May hearing, the company located and provided the committee a copy of instructions given by McNeil to its contractor on the Motrin matter. 
In those instructions, McNeil directed the contractor to purchase the product without engaging in discussions with store personnel. Having now seen those documents, I believe McNeil should have handled things in a more straightforward manner with the retail stores. We as a company have learned from this process and appreciate the Committee's help in highlighting these concerns. As I said at the outset, we have committed to deal aggressively and effectively with the quality and process issues we have at McNeil. Although we still have work to do, I do believe we are living up to that commitment. I would be happy to answer any questions you or the other Committee members might have. Thank you very much. Let me thank both of you for, for your statements and, of course, for being here. Uh, let me begin um, with you, uh, Mr. Weldon. Uh, in your prepared statement uh, to the Committee, you talk about a March the 23rd, 2009 field alert that was sent to the FDA about the defective Motrin. Uh, this is the product that was taken off the shelves during the phantom recall. That field alert says a third party has been contracted to perform an in-store assessment. That does not say anything about contractors going into stores and not communicating about a recall and buying all the effective products. Then on April the 1st, 2009, just about a week after McNeil told the FDA it would perform an assessment. A McNeil executive emailed your contractors with instructions for the phantom recall, and those instructions say, purchase all of the product and do not communicate to store personnel any information about this product. We also have an email dated April the 16, 2009, where an employee of one of your contractors informs McNeil that the phantom contractors had already completed 250 visits to stores. Mr. Weldon, don't these documents show that the phantom recall had already been performed in over 200 stores before you make any mention to the FDA about these the defective motrins? Uh, yes, it does, sir. May, may I offer some thoughts on this? Be delighted. Um, I, I think <clears throat> your comments are absolutely accurate and correct, and I think this is one of the areas where we have benefited by the guidance of the committee. Uh, if you look at the document in March, we were notifying the FDA that we were going to go and audit stores. Uh, when we went out in April, we, April 1st, I think it was, uh, to your reference, we audited stores and also purchased product. April 21st, I think we notified the FDA of exactly what we had done and what we, con what we were planning on doing uh, and completing this by July 15th, I think it was. Unfortunately, we did not notify the FDA that we would be purchasing this product. That was a mistake we made. We firmly admit that. Um, we also under hope that people would understand that if we went into an account and there was a minimal amount of product there and it was not, did not present a safety hazard to anybody but actually did not dissolve and give pain as, as quickly as we would like it to have been as it should have, we would take that product off the market. We made a mistake. We should have notified them that we would be taking these products if it was small amounts off the shelves. So you are absolutely correct that we, we made a mistake, but we feel we did keep people informed as to the actions we were taking. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate you know, your ex explanation. You know, um, uh, Ms. Goggins, when you testified before this committee four months ago, you indicated that Johnson & Johnson did not intend to hide anything about the phantom recall and that Johnson & Johnson did not know what the phantom contractors were doing. You also said that the affected motion was sparsely distributed. However, we now have documents that show McNeil wrote instructions for the phantom recall, and it is clear that McNeil's executives were fully aware of the phantom recall while it was going on. 
We also know that the phantom recall was not sparse because it involved at least 40 states. Can you explain this discrepancy? I'm sorry, sir. It, it, it contained at least 40, 46, you said? 40 states. 40 states. I'm sorry. Thank you. Look at this. Okay. Um, when I testified in May, sir, um, what I uh, was aware of at the time was that, um, as I said, we, we uh, verified that the FDA was aware that we were, um, as of the SN1 office of the FDA, was aware that we had hired contractors and we were going into stores and we were retrieving product. Um, we, and we've since determined that was since the uh, April 21st filing of the field alert report. Um, at the time, I was not aware of any retrieval actions going on, I don't believe, and I had not seen any instructions to, to uh, contractors until the excerpted instructions, I think, were exhibited that day during the hearing. Um, to Mr. Weldon's point, I think that we would agree that were we to do this over, um, we would certainly be more transparent, particularly with the store personnel, but I don't believe there was ever any intent to mislead or deceive the FDA, sir. When you say they were notified, what process did you use to do that? Um, we, I, to the point that Mr. Weldon made, and I believe in our testimony, um, the uh, FDA was notified by a field alert report and uh, submitted on April 21st, and then I believe there was ongoing, ongoing correspondence between that date and the agreed to date for the termination of that work, which was July 15th. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to continue along that line because our documents appear to be, again, a little different than what I am hearing. I have a McNeil document uh, dated March 23, 2009, to Ms. Torres, but very clearly it says, attached, please find the third follow-up to the field alert report for Motrin Caplet submitted November 26, 2008. So now, really, the, F the FDA was well informed November 26, 2008. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the first field alert report was filed in November of 2008. So let's put it in perspective, as Mr. Weldon had said. There was a stealth recall, phantom recall, purchase product, remaining product purchased back because it was less than effective. As, as prescribed. And I understand that that that's just as good a reason to get something off the market uh, as anything else, but it, it was not something that you took it and you were poisoned, you took it and you were hurt, but you took it and your headache didn't go away, right? That's pretty much okay. So this product that the FDA is aware doesn't work, dissolve, do its job properly. The FDA is aware of it November 26. So you've got pieces of November, all of December, all of January, all of February, almost all of March, and then in April, March, April, the product is actually removed. So in retrospect, one, it should have been removed quicker once you knew it didn't work. Two, Mr. Weldon, you have already said, and so have you, Ms. Goggins, that if you had to do over again, you would do it in a more general recall way. But I am trying to understand why the FDA was so slow in in going through to make a decision and why in earlier testimony they sort of say, well, we didn't find out, we didn't know, when in fact they knew for month after month and emails show that there was dialogue. I am going to ask you two a tough question because although I am very disappointed in Johnson Johnson, I said it in the first hearing, I say it again, this is not what we expected from a company with your history. But it happened. You didn't do your job well in a number of quality areas. But let me ask you, is your relationship ordinarily supposed to be so cozy as to have months of discussion and informal back channel and then be allowed to have, if you will, an undocumented recall? Is that what should be happening? Is that what we should expect from the FDA or tolerate? Both of you, please. Congressman Issa, <clears throat> um, I think that, that my response to that would be that I ask the same question about our organization. Is there a way we could do this faster? It seemed like exactly the same question you were asking. It, it seemed like it took a protracted period of time. And I think in the future we try and accelerate that to see if we could do it faster to get the product off the market. As far as relationships and things like that, I think it is important that there is dialogue between uh, the FDA in this case and our company to ensure that we are doing the right thing. 
So I can't comment exactly on the discussion okay. that went on or the relationship, but I think it is very important and very normal that there would be a dialogue before action is taken. Okay. Well, I am going to follow up with another question, because uh, uh, you can never take a CEO out, out once he has been one. When I looked at your reorganization, your July plan, I begged two questions. First of all, you have single line accountability from quality to quality to you. Should have been that way to begin with. But in, in, in our research, there was a period of time at McNeil where they were clearly trying to cost down QC. Today, who controls the decision of how much money the QC portion of, of any of your companies can spend? In other words, who is responsible for making sure they are fully funded and not part of an edict to lower cost? Congressman, respectfully, I would like to maybe clarify one point. We have gone back and looked at the period between 2006 and 2009, mm -hmm. and at best, the costs again, on quality at McNeil were flat. Actually, they, they increased during that period of time. And the headcount was, was constant also. There was not a reduction. No, that came out in the first hearing. And what I am looking at is in your plan going forward, because our responsibility is to fix the FDA going forward, but it is also to have confidence in companies like yours. Who determines if there are sufficient funds today? Does a plant manager, a division CEO, a uh, chief operating officer, chief financial officer, if, if an if the quality control people believe they do not have the resources, whether it is a new tool, uh, advanced uh, technology in the production line, or actual personnel, how is that done today so that we can know that those cost efficiencies are not being looked at by somebody far away and, and too many chains between them? Yes, sir. Uh, that, that would be determined by the quality people uh, directly to the individual who reports to me and myself. So, and we have let it be known that we will not get in the way of costs. We want to make sure we are investing appropriately in quality and that that decision it will be made directly up to and including myself. Okay. And then if you can quickly, Fort Washington, when it reopens, tell me how it is going to be different, different in a way the American people can believe in product that eventually comes from there. Sir, I, I would like to say we are working closely with the FDA. Uh, external consultants and our own people to invest, as I mentioned, $100 million across the McNeil, the McNeil facilities. We are going to make that the state-of-the-art facility. It will not be opened up until we are sure it is state-of-the-art. I would like to say it will be the best in the world. That is what we would like it to be. But I will guarantee it will be state-of-the-art and people can have the highest degree of confidence. We will not ship a product out of there until we have been able to satisfy the expectations of the people who will use our products. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Mr. Weldon, on August 19th, an, an online article in Fortune magazine suggested that McNeil had exceptional quality control measures until 2002, the year you assumed the position of chairman and chief executive officer. The article suggests that the cost cutting had a significant impact on the quality control staff and procedures across the company. Are you familiar with that, that article? Yes, sir. All right. Further, the article is critical of your ability to manage the consumer products business we are discussing today. Is it possible that uh, cost cutting contributed to the culture that created the quality issues? Sir, I do not believe that cost cutting contributed to this. Well, do you think that uh, cost cutting, the, the cost, do you think the cost cutting culture may have inadvertently created a situation in which phantom recalls and processes that did not put consumer safety first could occur? No, sir. Could I, could I elaborate on that? Because yeah, I, I only I, have five minutes. I do want you to answer, though, briefly. Okay. I, I said no, sir. I, I do not believe. I do not believe that cost-cutting nor financials were put ahead of the quality for patients at, at any of our facilities. So, well, in your testimony, you stated that McNeil believed that the phantom recall was an expeditious way to remove the remaining caplets from the convenience store shelves. If the product was not good enough or so safe enough to sell, why would it be good enough for consumers to keep it in their homes, in their medicine cabinets? Sir, um, first of all, I think we we had looked at this closely and determined there was no risk, no safety hazard, no risk to patients who consume these products. 
We thought it was a way to expeditiously get the product out of the market. And I think it was in May that we sent a letter to the customers notifying them of this action and telling them that we wanted to remove the products uh, that were in the facilities. Why do you think they conducted this phantom uh, uh, recall? Sir, I, I, that, that I can't address. I would not quite characterize it that way, but I, I do believe that we kept people informed. I think that we just talked about the document in April, in uh, March, saying that we were going to um, approach this in a way of taking an audit. We made a mistake in that we did not say we would be acquiring or retrieving the product during that period of time. But shortly thereafter, we notified the FDA of our actions, our intent, and that we would have this product off the market in July, and we executed against that plan. I noticed that Mr. Isa spent some time, uh, I guess, sort of halfway complimenting you on making changes. I think Ms. Goggins talked about changes that you all have made, and um, you made some significant changes, have you not? Yes, sir, and I think it is the guidance of the committee that's helped us see some of the changes and some of the issues that we, we really did need to, to make at the Fort Washington facility, and we've taken it beyond that to help ensure that we have actually learned and grown and continue to learn across Johnson & Johnson. Well, let me ask you this question about how much you've learned and, gr and, and grown. Um, Mr. Weldon, both you and Ms. Goggins have stated that you have addressed the issues with McNeil Consumer Health Care by changing the senior leadership. Yet Mr. Peter Luther, you know him? Yes, sir. The current president of McNeil remains in place. It seems disingenuous to suggest that you change leadership to fix the problem when key people involved in the decisions to conduct the phantom recall, and I know you don't call it a phantom recall, I call it a phantom recall, remain in place. Can you comment on whether Mr. Luther is, Luther is competent to do what is needed to fix the problem when he was involved in the problem originally? Yes, sir, and I, and I do appreciate the way you refer to the recall. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Luther has been a long-serving Johnson & Johnson employee. He has been a good employee for a very extended period of time. Mr. Luther also is very committed to, to, in, to improving and revamping the facility, and he's very committed to doing that. And we are looking forward to the results of what he is doing. So, yes, I think Peter Luther is a, is a good employee who will contribute to rectifying this problem. And so, and so the same folk that were around when the problem took place, you then put it in their hands to fix the problem. Is that it? And I think you, you, you said in a very, very sincere way that you were looking to get the public's trust. And we all know in order to get the public's trust, you need people in place that the people, that the people trust, the consumers trust. And to me, that doesn't make very much sense. And then put the person who was in charge when the problem came up back in charge. You follow me? Yeah, I do, sir. And I, and I think we, we all, as I said, share accountability in this. I think that Mr. Luther was in charge, but I think that you can see that there were many changes that were taken that were in the quality area, the manufacturing area, to ensure that we have the best representation there. As I said, Mr. Luther has been a long-serving employee who's done an, an, a very good job for us, but he is also um, committed to and has been very instrumental in making sure that we are revamping and improving the facility. So I think there's accountability that, that is shared across the organization, and I think that the players that we needed to replace have been replaced. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Congressman Chafee. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Ms. Goggins, uh, with the Motrin Phantom or Silent Recall Retrieval, uh, was it McNeil's understanding that until July 2009, the FDA was not requesting a recall? That's, is that correct? Yes, that is our understanding, sir. And had the FDA wanted or even suggested a recall at the time a problem was discovered, would you have issued a recall? In fact, I believe that the FDA told us um, in that time period that they wanted to uh, classify our retrieval as a recall, and we filed the forms almost immediately. Do you, uh, of the, what percentage of the product shipped was actually recalled? Do you have any idea? I am estimating it was about 1 percent of the, of the product shipped was recalled, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Weldon, you, you said in your, in your testimony that uh, you wanted the right thing to do was, was an imperative for, for you. 
I'm having a hard time with maybe the directive from the CEO's office and, and the way you feel personally with what happened on the ground. Were any of the personnel fired, relieved of their duties, dismissed, demoted? Did, what, what's happened to all these players that were involved here from, from your operation? I can't, I can't comment. I know some people have been relieved of their responsibilities and there's some new people in the facilities, yes, but I, I, I don't know all the direct uh, Ms. Goggins, answers. do you have? Yes. Um, um, to uh, elaborate on Mr. Weld, Mr. Weldon's point, um, we have a new, at McNeil, we have a new head of manufacturing, we have a new head of quality, um, and the two largest plants that we have, our Las Piedras plant and our Fort Washington plant, we have new people both in manufacturing Was and Was anybody quality. fired? Yes. Yes, that's my point. Uh, Mr. Weldon, I, I believe you when you personally say you want to do the right thing, but I have a hard time rectifying what was actually happening on the ground within your organization. You said you want to take personal responsibility for it. Let me read uh, this excerpt from March 24, 2009 emails from Bob Paul DePaulo, and pardon if I'm mispronouncing these names, to Daniel, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, Figus, Figus I guess is his name. Quote, the FDA is really bending the rules in this case, the, the Motrin Kaplan case, because of the fact that we stopped distribution a while ago. Doesn't that imply that there was some encouragement from Johnson & Johnson to bend the rules? Uh, you know, I, I, again, I, I can't directly know what was meant by that. It says that, the, you know, the, the email says exactly what it says. I think that uh, what we are looking at here is the ability to dialogue and make the right decisions. And you say that, but then when you say the FDA is really bending the rules, and that is coming from a Johnson & Johnson employee to another Johnson & Johnson employee, it doesn't look as if you are doing, quote, the right thing to do. Let me read another email. Um, quote, regarding FDA documents, all, this is from Eddie Carrillo, Carrillo to Carolyn Perizali. Again, I am slaughtering their names. Quote, regarding FDA documents, all my conversation with the FDA director, Ms. Torres, here in Puerto Rico, have been off the record since I cannot quote her. This happens due to my good relationship with her, and that is why we are doing something very different. Is that an appropriate mode of conduct? I mean, does this regularly happen above and beyond this one instance where you are having off the record discussions, that the relationship is so cozy? Is this, is this common practice? Is this something you condone? Is this an exception to what? No, we, we don't condone it, sir. I can't, I can't comment for the conversations that go on across, across the organization. What I can comment on is that we would like to have, and I think we have worked cooperatively, and I think 